Following recent homophobic attacks, groups are calling for more to be done to tackle hate-related violence. Joining us now is author Gavin McRae, who was the victim of a vicious homophobic attack, and Oshin O'Reilly, CEO with the organisation Outhouse. Thank you both so much Morning. for joining us today. And I think, Oshin, you know, we've heard of an awful lot of attacks on the streets of Dublin. Uh, Sligo, I think, shocked the nation and, and the world with what happened there uh, recently. And it feels like that there have been more homophobic attacks. And I don't know if that's played out within the figures because it just seems like we're maybe we're reporting more now because they're being, you know, there, people mightn't have said it to the Gardaí before. What's the situation on the ground? Yeah, like I suppose... It's really distressing, the situation at the moment. You know, the, the last research we have in Ireland says that one in 10 of the LGBT community faces a homophobic attack or violence at some point during their lives. And that was published in 2020 by the EU. You know, in I've taken over CEO in Outhouse nine weeks ago. In six of those nine weeks, there's been a homophobic assault somewhere in the city of Dublin. You know, um, the research tells us that 25% of people report homophobic crime. So if I know of six, there's probably 24. And I can't remember a time at any point in my career working in the LGBT community where this level of violence has taken place. And I'm doing this two decades. And going into this organisation, well, why did you go into this new role? Is it something that you felt that you really wanted to go in there and change because there is a, a need for, for a, a place for people to reach out? Because, I mean, it is quite frightening when you see this rise. Yeah, totally. Like, East. Outhouse is the LGBT community centre in Dublin. Traces its origins back to the, the 70s, and it's in its current configuration now, 25 years in Cable Street. And I went in because it was the first place or queer space that I entered when I was a teenager searching for who okay. I was as a person. It was that sense of connection to community, safety, self-discovery, you know, and Outhouse still plays that role for many. Um, and I suppose it is the original safe space within the community, you know, and I really feel that, you know, we had gotten to a point in Ireland where the notion of there being a safe space and almost the gay scene mm. had dissolved to a degree. Public safety attitudes had moved on and otherwise, and it really feels like there's a slip back of late. Really, I, you think there is absolutely a slip back? Well, I, I'm concerned or worried. You know, I don't think we can be complacent about these things but the anxiety, the fear, the worry that I see in people who come into the community centre every day is very palpable. Mm. Uh, we've spoken about it here on the show, about people feeling like there's a vibe in the air in the country, that some places are no-go areas. And we're not just talking about cities. It's all, it feels like all over the place. And maybe you're feeling at home, oh, eight, nine, six, triple one, triple one. But Gavin, something truly, during lockdown, something truly awful happened to yeah. you. Do you mind telling us? Yeah, it was about a month before lockdown, um, 1st of February of 2020 yeah and I had just uh, it was in the UCD library and I had just uh, emailed the latest the final draft of my second novel into my editor was feeling good was on the phone on the way walking home on the phone on the way home and I was attacked by a group of young boys aged between the about 12 to 14. What do you mean now how were you attacked? So I was walking along the Dodder behind the Dropping Well pub there. A public area? Public Very area. Very public area. It was only six in the evening no, just on my on my way home. Just going about your daily business, yes, yes. your life. On my own. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they started to, th to throw pebbles at me, to st throw stones at me, and then they started to throw abuse at me, homophobic abuse. Um, and then they followed me up the road and started to push me from behind. And then I fl I began to flag down some cars, and and that that scared them away, and they and they ran back. But then as I went back down towards the river. They followed me back down and then attacked me from behind. And more people arrived? No, no, the, no, no, yeah. no there were people on the road, but then I went, when I went back down to the river to a quiet area, yeah. they came up behind me and then attacked me from behind and they broke my nose and my cheekbone. Uh, and, uh, wh why do you think, <clears throat> you know, you're walking alone, you're yeah. minding your own business, yeah. and these guys just out of nowhere. Yeah. Obviously, Why? there's this, uh, the homophobic abuse, but I mean, like, you're not going off, you're not parading, no. uh, you know, trying to show off or anything? Yeah. I mean, is this something so that happens? happens? Were. I mean, but is this something, something that happens a lot? Or, it's know, something it's that I've given a lot of thought to because my, the attack last year was only the latest time I've been attacked. I started receiving homophobic abuse when I was 10 years old. Right. I was beaten up three or four times as a teenager. And then when I began to go into town as a gay man, an out gay man, an open mm. gay man, 
I was attacked two or three times as well in town. And leaving, leaving a pub or walking, once walking across the central bank, bank plaza. And then I moved away and there was a kind of 20 year hiatus. And then this attack was only the most recent attack. And because it happened in my 40s, mm. it was, and because the children were the same age as the people that used to attack me before, it was an opportunity for me to say, oh, hold on, this is the same experience that I was having back then. And it was really a, a chance for me to ask exactly that question that you've asked is, what, what is this? What is happening? Mm. And why me? And what I've realized are a couple of things. First of all, I've never been attacked by a, an individual man. It's always a man in group, okay. always groups. Yeah. The second thing is that I realized that for many years on some deep level, I, I, I felt this was punishment for me or that I was guilty, guilty of something. And you wouldn't have noticed that in my behavior, but on some deep level that I, I, was, in, I was being punished for something that I did. And it was only much more recently that I realized actually that's untrue Oh. That I'm not doing anything, and even if I was, you know, very outwardly gay or whatever, that's so what? So what? Sorry, I, I, I and just dividing what what is my business and someone else's business, mm -hmm. what's going on in their minds and, and 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 what's going on in my mind. And then the third thing I realize is that this isn't this isn't something that I brought on myself. This, I'm not the source of this. That it's someone that's happening in someone else's mind, and. And that was really a really important thing for me to realize. It's happening in someone else's mind, but it's perpetrated upon your yes. person, which obviously has an effect. These were 12 to 14 year olds. Yes. How many? Three, three of them attacked. Yeah. But then the police said from CCTV camera, there were around 10 of them. In around total. 10 of them. Yeah, yeah. 12 to 14, young yeah. kids. Yeah. I just can't understand how you can go, whatever about calling names, which is just horrendous as it is, yeah. but to physically attacking someone. Like, Oshin, we're talking about a situation where I'm assuming that we're all talking in sectors of society. Where are the guards on the ground? I think that's a, uh, the question I'm going to be asking the guards when I meet with them on Thursday afternoon. You know, I think So you are a, meeting with guards? They are, they've confirmed and we have a meeting at three o'clock on Thursday to discuss the situation. Um, and you know, when I sit down with them, I suppose that'll be one of the questions. I think in the short term, we need visible policing, we need boots on the ground, we need deterrence, we need patrols. But within that, what we also need is the confidence of the community to come forward and report crime. If only 25% of what's going on is actually reaching their ears, that gives them intelligence. When people come forward, they get to identify patterns that are happening on the ground. That helps them go, where do we put the patrols? Mm. You know. Um, so I think there's a real need for partnership. And for anyone out there who has been affected by a homophobic or a transphobic hate crime, you know, there are Garda diversity officers in every Garda station nationwide who are specifically trained to take reports of these crimes and you can ask for them at the public counter and they will come to you. Um, and, you know, issues around names, pronouns, you know, gender expression or identity or otherwise won't feature within kind of that. And it's really important for the community to come forward. And it's brilliant to hear that the Garda stations do have that. But again, it's just something we're asking all the time that there's just this lack of numbers of guards, unfortunately, and not out in the streets. And that's where we're seeing people need them. And I mean, Gavin, like when something like that happens to you, and when it happens to you even at the age of 10, mm. I, mean, I can't even imagine how frightening that is. Mm. But the fact that this happened more recently, yeah. you know, how does it affect your confidence now when you try to walk down the street? Whenever, you know, are you happy to walk alone during the day or at night time? Well, it took a lot of, when I was, you know, when I was being beaten up and, 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 and taunted as a, as a young boy, it has a profound effect on yeah. how, you, how you are and how you think about yourself. And you develop a kind of paranoia whereby when you approach a group, you're already imagining what they're thinking about you. Mm. And that takes a lot of work to eliminate from your own mind to say, okay, they're not necessarily thinking that about you. Yeah. They could be friendly, they could be nice. Yeah. And that took a lot of work over a very long time. And then after this attack, I noticed again, I was profiling again. I noticed when I walk along the street, I remember once a runner, just a jogger came up behind me. and I was like, whoa. Or if I see a group of, if I see a group of men together, I'm profiling, are they, are they drinking? Are they paying attention to what's around them? Or are they looking, yeah. you know, I'm just profiling again. Even though these people could be the nicest people in the world, they could but at be the same time. My new best friend, who knows? Absolutely. But yeah, I've noticed myself doing that more recently, yeah. And that, and that must be something you're hearing. 
Totally. The, and it's a universal experience for members of the LGBT community. You know, Panty spoke about this in her noble call speech on the stage of the Abbey in 2014 and the self-oppression we bring on ourselves when we're profiling the experiences around us all the time. Like I know it when I'm with my fiance and if one of us is heading home early after a night out and seeing someone to a taxi, I look around. Is it safe to give a peck on the cheek or not? Yeah. Am I going to bring commentary onto my life and my evening? Is, is that, is that recent? But like, because we were, we were so self-congratulatory after the marriage referendum in Ireland. We were like, we are the best boys and girls in all the land. Mm -hmm. Well done to all of us. And it was all great. Mm -hmm. And then things seemed to change, like shift people who had the rainbow flag as a profile. Um, and, and this is something that was discovered a few years into Trump were very much, you know, mm -hmm. anti-LGBT. Mm -hmm. So is it something that has changed in your behaviour over the past few years that you're like, uh, at the time of marriage equality, you were like, oh, this is great. And now you're like, oh, I'm going to... I'm going to self-censor now. Personally, no, it hasn't It's changed. always been like I've that. I've had that since my teens, that sense okay. of looking over your shoulder for where is it going to come from next? I've always had that question, personally. Um, you're meeting the, guard, uh, the guards very soon, but when we're talking about the, the Justice Minister, Helen McEntee, we have this hate crime legislation bill. Have you any idea of when this might be passed and, and what difference do you think that might help have? I think it's, we're hopeful that the legislation is going to be introduced. I would say it's unlikely now before the summer recess is my own take on it, but early in the autumn and within a year it should be enacted uh, would be our hope. You know, it is urgently needed. You know, the aggravating factor that hate has in the commission of a crime yeah. has to be recognised in law and there has to be a, a penalty yeah, that goes with that. Um, yeah. uh, Gavin, I'm just wondering how your experience was considering that in this country, you know, <laughs> being gay was illegal th mm. three decades ago. Yeah. How was your experience with the with the Guardian? Is it something, if we're only seeing 25% of people, as we're seeing with the Women's Aid report this morning, that women aren't reporting as much and, and gay people aren't reporting as much? Well, I never reported anything back in the past because, it, in, in, you know, when I was a, a younger boy, yeah. I was a, because it was totally normal that this would be happening. There was no, no one ever intervened, no teacher, no family member, no friend. You're it was gay. Totally is... normal. That was what was expected. The difference now is I got phone calls from the sergeant. They were extremely friendly, constant, you know, communication with me about the, about the case. Okay. They never apprehended the people, um, and that's fine. They did their best. But I know that the culture has changed in that sense. They were very, very helpful. Very, yeah. very helpful. And indeed. in reporting, in it an, was yeah. a safe space for you to yes, do so. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Which is a huge difference. I know yeah. that you've written about this. You were writing your novel at the time, yeah. um, obviously coming home from doing that, yeah. but everything's changed since then. Yeah, I was going to launch into a third novel and then I, this happened. And at the same, then a month later, lockdown happened. So I was living with my mother. Yeah. Um, thinking about the questions that we were, we were talking about today. Why did no one protect me? And now we're all thinking about protection of you know, COVID, protecting others, protecting yeah. ourselves. And so I started to write about that and wrote a, wrote a non-fiction sort of memoir, which features this attack and features various things about me coming to terms with this violence in my life and the effect on my relationships and the effect on my family. So it's we got to read a bit of it. It's amazingly written. I know it's out in it's called Cells and it's Cells out in, in um, it's out in November, yeah. and uh, it's Stock, very a great stocking gift to a uh, shock family. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's what you mean. Well, listen, uh, we know that you're meeting on Thursday. You're going to be meeting uh, the Guardian in relation to this. Uh, so, Oshin O'Reilly, CEO of Outhouse, thank you so much for joining us.